It seems that aluminum chassis for bolt-action rifles is just all the rage these days, but is there anything to them? Well, honestly, I don't know, but I know how we can find out. I know chassis systems are becoming extremely popular for bolt-action rifles these days. They're even coming out with rifles now with integral receivers and so forth, like the SIG Cross. Well, my friend Steven recently got a Ruger M77 Mark II chambered in 308 with a heavy barrel on it, and he wanted to put it in a chassis system. So he's already swapped it out. Actually, our friend Joey did that. And what we're going to do today is we're going to set this rifle up for him, and we're going to go try it out. Because I have yet to try one of these type chassis systems. So I'm curious as to what can we learn from this rifle. Since this is a new rifle to Steven, it's used, but new to him, and we're setting it up for him. First thing we're going to want to do is check out this bore and probably do a good cleaning on it. And with that said, that's great that we're going ahead and doing a cleaning and routine maintenance. All right, because really what we're doing today is we're just checking out this chassis system, and, or at least I'm seeing what I think about it. What I want to go through all the things I would normally go through with a rifle in order to really be able to evaluate it. And part of that is just routine cleaning the bore. So there's the chamber. There's the throat. There we go. We're into the lens. Like a lot of jump to the lens, but that's okay. They're even. And I have to say, this this bore is looking really good. I'm not really seeing anything to clean here to speak of. So that tells me somebody took really good care of this rifle. We've got a little hard carbon in there at the end, but nothing much. Well, that made that easy. We, ain't got, we don't have much cleaning to do here. Even though this bore looked great, I'm going to go ahead and run a brush and a few patches through here just to make sure there's no loose impediments that I might have missed with the bore scope or something. It's, a good practice and this shouldn't take but a second because it is in such good shape and that cheek piece is in the way. Let's see if we can go, no we ain't going under it. Okay so that's first thing, first issue we ran into with the chassis is, and it, you're going to run into this with high cheek pieces, it's adjustable but we're going to have to let this down in order to be able to get a cleaning rod in here to clean the barrel properly. If I had this rifle set up exactly like I wanted it with the cheek piece at the right height and everything's just perfect, I would want to make sure that I marked the height of the cheek piece so that after cleaning I could put it back in that same spot. Which that would be something for Steven to do later on. but. Anyway, just something to pay attention to. All right, a couple of Allen screws. And this is an MTD chassis that he got for it. Okay, it's still tight. Yeah, let's just pull this out. There we go. All right, that's close. I, I wouldn't be getting a cleaning rod with a really big handle on the end, so I was planning on going through using the jag on my Dewey's rod. That handle's probably going to be a little big for this, so I might just stick with this one for the cleaning here. Now for a few patches. I 
Now to finish it off with some dry patches. Next we got to put a scope on here. And Steven's already picked out the scope he wants to go with in the setup. And this being a Ruger, it has the integral bases in it. So this would normally use Ruger rings. And I kind of like that. I, I hate having to buy Ruger rings, but on the plus side, I don't have to buy bases. And by the bases being actual part of the receiver, there's fewer moving parts. And that's always a good thing. But Stephen wants a rail on there. So there's this here is a setup somebody came up with that will mount to the integral bases. And I would show me putting this on, but for whatever reason, YouTube is just a fanatic about they don't want you mounting scopes. I don't get it. But anyway, and as to what the limit is on that and where the cutoff is, I can't tell you. And with this, though, it's pretty self-explanatory. So I'm going to attach this real quick. Okay, the rail is installed, and I followed the directions that came with it implicitly. And this is the Wayland Combat Handguns Incorporated rail for the Ruger M77. I don't know how it's going to work. It's aluminum. I'm not too crazy about that, but hey, not my rifle, not my scope, not my rail. Now for the scope. And this is a Vortex Venom. It's a 5x25, 34 millimeter tube, 56 millimeter objective lens. And that's what Stevens opted to go with on this rifle, which he's going to use it as a target rifle. And I think this is what's driving so many changes in rifles now, the scopes. They're getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And this one's huge. Okay, well, when we get a scope this big, 56 millimeter objective lens, it's got to go higher up in the air just so we've got clearance between the barrel and the scope. Well, on a traditional rifle stock, we just lost our cheek weld. I mean, our, our top of our stock's down here somewhere to be able to look through the scope. Well, that's where the adjustable cheek pieces come in. All right, so with these big, huge scopes, we need an adjustable cheek piece. And I think the scopes themselves are what's driving so many of the changes in the stocks. For myself, I would go with a, any traditional rifle, which almost all of mine are, wooden stocks. I'm going with a 40 millimeter objective lens and a one inch tube just to keep the scope low so I've got a great cheek weld. Yeah, and that's, that's not really an option with a scope like this. All right, so let me get this locked in place, and we should be about done here. There's nothing left for us to do at this point, but just go try it and see what we've got. Normally, I wouldn't have been able to shoot today because of the weather. It's not exactly favorable, but Stephen has been doing a ton of work on the range. He's turning this into a really nice shooting facility. So we're actually under a roof today. Steven's still got a lot of work to do here, but it's turning out pretty nice. And what he's going to do is he's going to put a platform off to the side here to shoot from and then have a bench here at the bottom and then straight out in front. He's got 500 yards to shoot. So yeah, pretty nice setup. I'm set up now and I was just about to start bore sighting this rifle, but I realized with this cheek piece, I can't. So I got to get this out of the way. And thankfully, I brought a few tools with me just in case. But there's something else to keep in mind. Okay, that should get us on paper. That's all I can say. And for our ammo, I didn't do hand loads for this, so we're not load testing. It's Steven's rifle, he shoots factory ammo. So we're gonna do the Federal 168 grain, yeah, um, match. Shot great and his other Ruger that we set up for him. So hopefully we'll get really good results out of this one. And I would love to be able to say we're checking the accuracy of the chassis system but I can't say that because we that would be unfair to the chassis system because there's no telling if it's going to like this, if this rifle's going to like this ammo. So we would need to do some load testing to really say for certain. With that said, though, 
I am hoping we'll get some good groups here, so let's find out. Let's go ahead and send a couple more down there and hey, we might even get a good group. Okay, you saw my battery died, which wouldn't have been a problem. Except for a lot of people showed up while I was changing batteries, and it turned into a social event out there. Which was good. It just wasn't conducive to shooting and filming. So I went ahead and wrapped it in, but then I went back the next day. I did want to get some rounds through here. Okay, unfortunately, the conditions had changed just a little bit. That's why we're in the shop right now, and I'm telling you what I got. But, okay, I ran, shot four groups through here during times when wind had calmed down. So I, I'm not worried about the wind affecting the shots. And Okay, here was the first group. Okay, not horrible. All right, then second group. Okay, I have no idea where that really high shot came from, but I'm pretty certain it's me. I don't, I was loading the bipod on most of them. I didn't remember leaning into it with that one. I'm guessing that's where it came from. I just didn't load the bipod. All right, so third group, and I paid particular attention to it on the third group. Here it is. Okay, so she's shooting pretty decent. And for the fourth group, I wanted to try it without the bipod and just on my standard rest. So here's what we got with that. Okay, not bad. Um, I'm tickled with the accuracy of the rifle. It could have been better, but like I said at the start, that's with no load testing at all. That's just grabbing a box of 168 grain match ammo. Okay, so a little load testing. I'm sure this would be a tack driver. Um, scope, the base, everything seemed to do pretty good. Held zero. Okay, so I got my shooting in though. And I got to see what I thought of the chassis system. And really and truly, I had to think on this because, I mean, it wasn't bad. I didn't mind it. And the first thing I noticed was how it changed the recoil of the rifle. Okay, I, And the video I, I did on learning how to drive a rifle. I talked about keeping everything connected through recoil. So my head and shoulders and rifle, everything moving backwards together. And I also talked about with the rifle, we want the rifle to recall straight back and then return to where we, exactly where we were. Okay, so we don't want a bunch of muzzle jump, jumping all over the place. Now some rifles, depending on the weight of the rifle, the cartridge is chambered in, higher recalling cartridges, they're gonna jump. Right? But that's what we're trying for when we're shooting, is keep everything connected and then just straight back and forward. This design helps with that. And several of y'all mentioned it in that video where I talked about learning to drive a rifle. This is closer to an AR style. Okay, so we've got the stock. It's, all the energy is traveling right here. Okay, well this is a lot closer to being in line with the bore. And with an AR, it is in line with the bore. You got your buffer tube and stock there directly in line with the bore. Well, think about it on this stock here. 
if this is recalling straight back, all right, if we stop it down here, way below the center of the bore, and it hits right here, everything's going to want to do this. Okay, whereas if we stop it here, it's just going to want to stop. Okay, well normally we're stopping it here below the bore, so, we, you know, that encourages a little jump, unless we have really good shooting technique. This made it so that I didn't have to have as good a shooting technique. And you can see from the side view. Okay, very little jump there at all. That, the stock helped that. That was not my shooting skill. <clears throat> now that's not necessary to shoot accurately. I think it just gives us a good feel for what we're trying to achieve when we're working on shooting, practicing. Okay, that, that's what we want. And it, this made that easier to do. Now, again, as far as accuracy, I, I don't see any, any advantage there. Okay, so that's one interesting thing I noticed. And it, I, did, I liked shooting it. I just started thinking, okay, where would this fit in? What would be a good application for this rifle, for this type stock chassis system? And what I came up with is I think where this would really shine is in extreme long range precision shooting out in the field where you're actually out there having to carry the rifle. Okay, long range precision shooting, I would, at a range, I would prefer traditional target style stock. So the really wide four in, I think that's a lot more stable off of a bag and having it, you can put a bipod on it, whatever. I just think this is more stable. Okay, and I would want an adjustable cheek piece or a really high comb or to build this comb up a little bit. Okay, and this particular rock stock here, the original stock for this rifle, this does have an extremely high comb. Okay, because it is a more of a target stock. And the really vertical pistol grip here, that's, that's what you want on target rifles, whereas a hunting rifle, I want more horizontal. All right, it points quicker, you get on target quicker. That's why shotguns, field shotguns, out, you know, where you've got to get on a bird quick, that's why they're more horizontal. Okay, if I, I wouldn't want to carry this though. And that's where this chassis shines is if I had to actually go out in the field and carry it. This is a lot lighter than this. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> that's where I see the advantage with this. And okay, lighter. That's when we that's why we use regular style hunting stocks that aren't as big as this because they are lighter and where we have to actually carry them in the field hunting. Okay, so how does this compare to standard hunting stock? Okay, for me. I think the advantage to this over a, a standard hunting stock, I'm not even going to say it's an advantage. I think where this shines over a traditional hunting stock, if you're going to put a big huge optic on it like this, okay, original ARs, M16s, okay, they had the, the really high front sight that looked like the big letter A up there and then the rear sight and the charging handle. Or carrying handle really up high. The reason they did that was because of that buffer tube. All right. What that did is the butt was more in line with the bore. All right. So the butt was higher in the air. What that meant was when you shouldered it, that put everything lower. Okay, so you had to have higher sights to be able to look down through the sights. All right, standard hunting stock, everything's closer, your sights are closer to the bore. The bore's higher up, but it's in a more natural position as far as your sights. Okay, you get to using a big, huge optic like this, way up in the air. This works out great for that, especially with adjustable cheek piece. This wouldn't work on a standard hunting stock. Okay, now, that doesn't mean I prefer this over a standard hunting scope and a standard hunting rifle. This is huge and it's heavy. All right. I wouldn't want to add any more weight than was needed to a hunting rifle and this is excessive weight here. 
uh, standard three by nine by 40, four by 12 by 40. That's gonna do everything I need to do out in the field hunting. Now, if I wanted to do target shooting at a thousand yards, okay, something like this, okay, that's where this comes in. But it's extremely heavy and again, way up in the air. So that's where this stock starts for me to make sense. Okay, now I don't go out into the field hiking and shooting a thousand yards very often, but I'm sure some of you out west might do that. Okay, so that, that's where the chassis systems, that's where I see that, you know, being a, a good option. Anyway, that was my thoughts and what I learned on this for whatever that was worth. And yeah, good project. Okay, God bless and have a great day.